Good afternoon, family. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Happy Father's Day to all you dads. In this instant that we're covering today, Jesus is being tested again. And he demonstrates some things that I believe a man, a father, uh, represents in his life. So there are a few characteristics of Jesus that we're going to look at today that I think goes in keeping with a good Father's Day lesson. So we can kind of mix them in there. Question, how do you react when someone tests you? It's a tough thing to be tested. Sometimes we might get offended, maybe a little defensive. It's hard not to let our emotions get the best of us when we realize somebody is putting us to the test. And this is not the only thing that we're going to learn about Jesus, how to be a temperate person, how to temper your emotions uh, like Jesus did in this uh, event. But we also learn about judgment, the kind of person, the kind of character that Jesus was when he is presented with this woman who committed adultery. Jesus' character is revealed as to what kind of a judge he is, and we should be grateful for the kind of judge that he presents himself to be. We know that people tend to go to extremes, either lacking in mercy for very selfish reasons, or just not caring about the truth or morality at all, being extremely liberal. And the Pharisees were already judging Jesus as being liberal. They kind of looked at Jesus as being somewhat liberal, not really uh, thinking that Moses' laws were important and that should be kept. That was their interpretation of him, that he didn't really care about the law. But Jesus always turned the issue to them. He always made it about their heart. And we're going to see him doing that today in this incident. A little word, though, before we get into the scriptures today, which is John chapter 7, 53. That's like the last verse of John chapter 7, all the way through chapter 8, verse 11. Now, if you notice in some of the Bibles, it's going to say, like I put there at the top, it's going to indicate some of the earliest manuscripts may not include these verses, or some manuscripts do not include these verses. So being that we are also learning about Bible study and all these things throughout this series of Life in Christ, I wanted to clarify this, because often I've been asked the question, well, what does that exactly mean? These notations might leave you with doubt about the text's authenticity, but it really has nothing to do with that. And without getting too deep into the subject of Bible translation, I just want to let you know that this type of notation is added by scholars when they're translating from a particular type of text. Older and earlier manuscripts don't necessarily mean that they might be more authentic or more trustworthy. It really depends on the text type. And I put this little map underneath there. There are about four general text types where most of our manuscripts from the New Testament come from. And you can see that they're kind of centered around different regions of the world. You've got your Alexandrian texts that are more originated from Egypt. Uh, the Byzantine texts originated from Syria. So they tend to be uh, aggregated by area. And the notation that you see there in your Bible, not just in these verses, but sometimes in other verses as well, is to distinguish really where is the type of text from. Uh, most of the newer translations post-1900 are translated from a compilation called the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament. You've probably heard about that. And these codices mostly are from the Alexandrian type, which are largely developed around Egypt. And some of those include the oldest manuscripts known. Older translations, like the King James Version, were translated mostly from the Byzantine type codices. So they're not going to have those notations that you sometimes see in the newer translation. So that's the reason why. Many call this text, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 53 through 8, 11. Sometimes they're called floating texts because we don't know exactly where to put them. 
Uh, some of the older types do not include these verses, but most of the well-distributed and known types do. So we don't have any reason to doubt its authenticity because there are plenty of manuscript evidence that does include these verses. So I just wanted to let you know that just in case you had any doubt about this. And if you have any kind of interest in knowing about Bible translations and how all these things develop, well, we actually have some links on our website, um, licoc.org, to an in-depth study on this issue, uh, Greek transmission of the New Testament and Bible translations, one of my favorite topics. So let's get into the text, shall we? Little Bible lesson there for you this morning. John chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 2. Jesus had just returned from teaching at the Feast of the Booths. And now he's up in the next morning, very early, it says here, he returned to the temple courtyard. All the people went to him. So he sat down and began to teach them. This is occurring the day after Jesus is teaching at the Feast of the Booths where he famously declares to those who believed in him, would have streams of living water flowing from deep within him. Jesus was declaring himself as the true light in this feast. And all the people were fascinated. They were gathered around him, and they wanted to hear him teach. But something happens. The scribes and the Pharisees bring in a woman who had been caught committing adultery. And they make her stand in front of everyone and ask Jesus, teacher, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. Now, get a feel for this moment. Here he is, Jesus, he's at peace. He's teaching the people. He sat down. They're all having a grand time. And all of a sudden, here come these scribes and Pharisees and interrupt this teaching session and bring this woman who was probably like ashamed and embarrassed to be brought out and accused, first of all, of what she was being accused, and made her stand in front of this crowd. Think of this picture and how that woman was probably feeling and really what the motives of these scribes and Pharisees were in rudely interrupting Jesus as he is teaching. They say that they had, had caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Now, according to the law, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, this had to have been witnessed by at least two people in order to accuse anybody from this. There are some today who try to, who have tried to like redefine the meaning of what that word adulter adultery means. They claim it just means covenant breaking and does not refer to the literal act of committing adultery. But this passage seems to prove that position to be false because they're kind of emphasizing that she was caught in the very act. The very act of what? Well, the very act of adultery, not the very act of covenant breaking. Uh, so question, if there were, see, when I read about this, I'm like, okay, was somebody like looking at that? They put cameras to try to, was there a peeping Tom around there? You know, say, okay, we, we got her set up. We, we caught you. I mean, this is, you know, a very private thing. So how, how does this happen? Were they setting her up? Uh, how do you catch someone committing uh, this very act? Or unless you know it's about to happen. And since this was adultery, this means that the woman or her partner were married, right? And where was the other party? Because the law was very clear that both parties needed to pay the penalty. But in this case, they only bring the woman. They only bring half of the party. Uh, both needed to be held accountable. So the whole incident really right off the bat just uh, shows some red flags and smells of partiality on behalf of these scribes and Pharisees. Their intent was just to put Jesus to the test. Did they really care about the law? Because if they really did care about the laws, they said that they did, then they would want to go about this in a way that the law said to go about it, like having two witnesses and then properly taking care of this matter instead of just bringing her to Jesus and kind of putting Jesus to the test, which is what we know they were doing. 
they continue saying, in his teachings, Moses ordered us to stone women like this to death. What do you say? So here again, they're baiting him to try to say, oh, they're daring him. Are you going to say something different than Moses? Are you going to say something different than the law? And of course, verse 6 says they asked this to test him. They wanted to find a reason to bring charges against him. But Jesus bent down and used his finger to write on the ground. Something that is very interesting here. Uh, clearly, a test for Jesus. Uh, they cared nothing for the law. They were only interested in perhaps cooking up some charges against Jesus. They wanted to try to catch him as they claimed they caught this woman. Uh, but if they had really believed uh, their earlier indictment of him as a Sabbath breaker, they, why would they con be continuing to teach or search for other things that he was breaking? You know, if they really believed that he was a Sabbath breaker and they weren't able to fully convict him on that, why were they still looking to catch him breaking some other law? So you can see that they were after him. They just wanted to catch him saying something wrong, but there was nothing wrong that he was saying. And, you know, when someone is simply trying to get a response from you because they're testing you, notice how Jesus reacts here. He's not really giving into it. He's just still calm. The text says that he didn't retaliate. He didn't say anything to them. He just was calmly and nonchalantly, you know, writing with his finger on the ground, right? We don't know what he was writing exactly, but he's just kind of like, okay, let, let them say what they got to say. You know, uh, let's see what happens with this. And that kind of shows me strength of character. Jesus is holding his ground. He's showing patience. He's showing meekness, showing temperance. Uh, he might have just been scribbling something on the ground. We don't know exactly what he was doing. But he was probably being very patient. So patient that notice that the next verse says, they persisted in asking him questions. They kept kind of bugging him. Say, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? They wanted to elicit some kind of response from him. And finally, Jesus stands up. He straightens up. And he gives an amazing answer to them. Probably not what they expected. Not what they were looking for. But again, just a wonderful, brilliant answer that only God's son can give to people like this. The person who is sinless should be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he calmly sits down, <laughs> continues writing on the ground with his finger. As always, Jesus finds the answer in the scripture. And he points out from Deuteronomy 17, 7, that the witnesses are the ones that must start the execution. That's what the law clearly had said, that those who had witnessed the event should be the ones to start casting the stones. And then everyone else should join them. That's what Deuteronomy 17, 7 says. So what is Jesus doing here? He obviously realizes that the witnesses are missing. And not just the witnesses, but the other party that was supposedly had committed adultery with this woman. So he demands that the witness, where are they? Show me the witnesses. That they're the ones who should start this process of casting the stone. But he adds something else to this though. He demands something else. That such a witness... Who is going to cast these stones must themselves be without sin. And it's surprising how the Pharisees get you know, caught by surprise and don't even know how to answer. He caught them in their own trap. The Pharisees' trap had closed without taking Jesus. The Lord had neither condoned any kind of sin, because they were probably trying to get him. They knew he was merciful, and maybe they were trying to get him to say something like, oh, well, you know, it's not necessary to condemn them or show grace or show mercy. In other words, trying to uh, prove that Jesus was very liberal and didn't really care about the law of Moses. Or maybe they wanted Jesus to say, that's right, stone her. And then maybe try to get him in trouble with the Romans. 
because under the Roman law, they were not supposed to uh, do any, uh, any killings like that. But Jesus had just turned the tables by an appeal to their conscience. There being no coward like a guilty conscience. Jesus here did not disobey the law of Moses. It wasn't his responsibility to carry out that specific law. He allowed those involved in that decision to make their own minds. It was the witnesses, but where were they? And not just the witnesses, but witnesses that they themselves were free of guilt in this case. So after Jesus says that, imagine, because everybody probably stood still for a moment, like uh, we didn't expect them to say something like that. So the silence must have been deafening by what they had heard Jesus say. And, and maybe, I don't know, maybe he was writing something on the ground. We don't know exactly what it was. Maybe he was writing Deuteronomy 17, 7. Maybe he was writing something else. I don't know. But what we see happen next obviously shows that they got the message from Jesus. One by one, beginning with the older men, the scribes and the Pharisees left until Jesus was alone with the woman. So I don't know how much time passed, but Jesus was cool about it. You know, he was just there writing whatever he was writing on the ground, not even noticing perhaps that these men were leaving one by one. But those who were older, they realized that their scheme had failed. All of a sudden they came to their senses and said, wow, he caught us again. <laughs> And maybe they were kind of nudging their younger fellows, you know, we can't really do anything here. We're, we're the ones who've been trapped instead of us trapping Jesus. And they were leaving one by one. They knew that they were not prepared to produce a witness and much less a sinless witness to this crime that they supposedly saw as they said they had caught her in the very act. She was standing before a very hostile crowd. Now she is standing before Jesus. Big difference. There were no longer two witnesses. There were no longer any witnesses. So according to the law, Deuteronomy 17, 6 and 7, she could not be stoned because there was no one there to actually carry this out but there was one person that could have done it there was one person that was sinless that could have cast the stone and that same person we know who knows everything could have also been the witness to cast that stone jesus was perfectly able to have made a judgment in this case because he knows everything and he is sinless. So what he posited to the scribes and the Pharisees, they couldn't carry it out, but he could. But what does he say to the woman? He straightens up, he stands up and he asks her, where did they go? Has anyone condemned you? And the woman answered, no one, sir. Jesus said, I don't condemn you either. Go. From now on, don't sin. Where are the people that condemn you? They will not be there when you are before Jesus. And if you're the one in the habit of condemning, you will have to leave Jesus' presence since you are not without sin and therefore incapable of condemning anyone in the presence of Jesus. Often we are belittled, shamed by those who offer a judgment against us, sometimes based purely on their opinion, maybe sometimes just from their perspective, they cast a judgment, they cast dispersions on us or on you from their perspective, or just simply out of impure motives, out of jealousy as they were doing to Jesus. 
The scribes and the Pharisees were jealous of him. They saw him as, as someone infringing on their ministry. And they wanted to trap him. Maybe you, maybe somebody is jealous of you. And with impure motives, spite, hatred, pride, selfishness. They try to guilt you or shame you into something. Even though, even though you didn't do anything. But even though we are innocent, sometimes that has a profound effect on us. When people cast dispersions and, and judge us. In a way, imagine how much more so if we really are guilty <laughs> and they do that as well. I can only imagine that poor woman, she probably was guilty. She didn't say anything in her defense. And Jesus, who knows all things, didn't say anything either. The only thing he said is, go and sin no more. But she found herself in the presence of a very merciful Savior. Thank you, Mark, for that, for that lesson, because the name of Jesus is sweet and is fragrant and is amazing. God saves. And here he shows it in this instant where men want to judge with whether with, with impure motives or the right motives or with the law. Jesus means to forgive. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus is in the habit of saying, yeah, whatever, you know, you're good, you're clean, you're good. It's not like he's doing that. He's not trying to uh, uh, let people go or belittle sin. That's not his intent here. I'm sure that the Pharisees were trying to make it seem as if Jesus didn't care for sin or the law at all. But no, notice his encouragement to her. Go, yes, I don't judge you, I don't condemn you, but stop sinning. So Jesus wants to forgive us, but at the same time gives us the admonition. The only way you're going to move forward in peace and being thankful of the forgiveness is if you turn your life around. Don't just go and keep doing what you're doing. That's not what the Son of God is about, as he demonstrated here in this case. See, Moses' law could have condemned her if those two witnesses were produced. But Moses' law also made that exception that Jesus took advantage of. Hey, if the, two, if the witnesses aren't here, don't worry. I'm not going to condemn you either. He offered mercy, which is not the same as laxity. You understand the difference? He wasn't lax about it. Because if he were lax about it, then there wouldn't be any mercy, would there? If God was this big grandpa in the sky, and I don't know why people say that, you know, like, like as if grandpas were lax <laughs> and didn't care about things. I don't think that's, but people say that, right? Oh, you know, he's just some old great grandpa. We're going to sit on his lap and he's not going to condemn us. He's going to be just fine with everything that we do. I don't know where people get that image from, but I hear People saying that kind of thing. And no, God is not a lax God. Because if he was, then he wouldn't be merciful, would he? Those two things are opposite. But God does offer mercy. And he says, go and stop sinning. Meaning, he expects us to do better. He wants us to improve, not continue in the same vein that got us in trouble in the first place. So in this passage, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they thought they were being some kind of light by bringing this woman accused of adultery before Jesus. But they exposed her to test him or to humiliate her or to appear righteous, all wrong motives that unfortunately occur in this fallen world where we are. Whatever the motive it was, it was definitely not a true, genuine, and loving motive. We can only see that coming from the Lord Jesus. When yes, he exposes sin, but he does so that we might repent and that we might shine with him. 
Jesus is the light of the world. He can see all things. And he saw this woman. He saw her. But he chooses mercy as opposed to condemnation. That is our God. That is our Father. If there is a choice, he always chooses mercy. All throughout the book of Ezekiel, when, when God was at his most upset with the nation of Israel, you, you read Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and God is showing his heart, as I've shared with you before. And even though in Ezekiel, where he was the most upset with the nation of Israel, he always kept saying, I don't desire for the death of the wicked. He always ended that way, showing that he is a merciful God, as embodied here in Jesus Christ. If Jesus is merciful with us, if our Father is merciful with us, his children, what kind of fathers should we be? Now, remember, there is a difference between being lax and uncaring about what happens and being merciful like Jesus was, observant and merciful and holding others accountable. That's hard. It's easy to be lax. It's easy to not care at all. Yeah, whatever. You know, whatever you want to do, do it. <laughs> and, and that is a parent, parental lifestyle sometimes that we see nowadays. It's a whole lot harder to teach people to be accountable to themselves and to be a better version of themselves. Only a real, genuine father in the spirit of our father in heaven could do something like that. If you recall, Gerard uh, shared with us last Wednesday in Matthew 18, the direction that Jesus gives us on what to do when people sin against us, when our brothers sin against us. And Jesus later on tells the story of the unforgiven, unforgiving servant. And he concludes that instruction by telling us that we must forgive our brothers 70 times, seven times, not just Seven times, as Peter suggested. Right? Seven times? Okay, you know, I can forgive somebody seven times. And the eighth time, that's it, I'm done. But Jesus says, no, 70 times seven, meaning indefinitely. Not literally 70 times seven, which is what? 240-something somebody told me the other day. But never forget that Jesus is going to judge us with the same measure that we judge others too. The same measurement that we use to judge, that will be applied to us. God knows our hearts. He knows what's in our hearts. And we should be so grateful that that picture of the woman caught in adultery, who is that picture? Isn't that us? Haven't we been caught in the very act of sin? Nowhere to hide? People pointing out to us our faults, and they're right, because we are guilty, who can say here that they're innocent of anything? We are that woman, caught in the very act. And whether it's with pure motives or not, it doesn't matter. People accuse us and judge us. And whatever results in our life here, probably a lot of times it's going to be without mercy, <laughs> but with a lot of judgment, unfairly. But thankfully, we're not just caught and brought up before people, <laughs> but before Jesus. And at the very end of the age, guess who is the only one that's going to be left standing? And everybody's going to be before him, before the merciful judge. So this picture of the woman caught in adultery is very much like the picture of judgment day. We are going to be left alone and Jesus is going to look up and says, who condemns you? Nobody can. And as Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So if we are standing there like that woman, full of guilt, Definitely guilty, but the Son of Man chooses not to condemn us, and we are free people indeed. 
And that's what the gospel is all about. Jesus does not want to condemn us. He could, but he does not want to. The world makes admitting to guilt a shameful and anxiety-ridden process. We'd, go some, we'd rather go on pretending nothing has happened in order to keep up appearances. To, the, to us, it's more important to keep up appearances of guiltlessness or shamelessness rather than being transparent. But before God, we are all like glass. God is with those who admit their faults and who want to do better. There is no anxiety before the Lord, only before mankind. God wants to remove the anxiety of appearances by saying, hey, why don't you just be what I made you to be? Whereas in the world, we're always trying to kiss up to whatever people want us to be. And we want to keep up these appearances. I think that woman probably was very anxious, and frustrated, and scared. And she was brought up by that crowd of Pharisees and scribes. But when she was alone with Jesus and she heard, I don't condemn you, what a weight off. I think she was motivated to improve herself after that. And we know that that was the story with Mary Magdalene and with many others who continued to follow Jesus after a similar incident. Before the cross of Christ, we find true rest for our souls. No room for anxiety. Only man-made religion gives you anxiety. Man-made judgments and opinions. There is no such thing before God. There is peace in your soul. But you can't pretend before God, though. <laughs> you got to let go of that. That's what gives you anxiety, pretending. You know? No need to judge before God. Only room for loving one another with truth. That's what the church is about. Now, granted, we're not perfect. <laughs> Sometimes we may cause anxiety to one another because we're still growing in how to show love. But that's what a family is about, right? We all grow together. For some, truth may be too much to face at the moment. So they lie to seemingly escape anxious moments. But they are delaying the inevitable. In Jesus, truth is a bomb to be welcomed. Truth is freeing. And those who recognize the power of this gospel, who understand that the Son of Man would rather give up his life and offer it as a sacrifice so that we could be forgiven, so that we could now interface directly with God. If we recognize that, then we should welcome that and recognize that that truth frees. This is the sacrifice Jesus made for us. And we want to accept this gift and in return, offer our very lives in our first act of submission is by being baptized. When we are immersed in water, we're accepting Jesus' gift, his blood to cleanse us, to make us righteous. It's amazing that somebody like us who are very guilty, caught in the very act, can be made as pure and as white as snow by Jesus' blood. That's what he's offering. Talk about starting over with a clear conscience. There's no other way that you can do it other than in Christ. How freeing. What a great way to start over. And that first step of baptism is our first step of loyalty to this Messiah. The first step of obedience to the gospel. Many of us have engaged, have done that today. Uh, lately, we have a, a sister. Uh, she, she's, she's here, Anne Marie. Great. We're going to sing to her because she decided that, yes, she wanted to be freed by Jesus' blood. 
rather than carry our guilt. Why, why continue carrying your guilt? <laughs> why continue carrying all that garbage when Jesus wants to free you? But I know sometimes it's hard. We're trapped by our very own hearts, trapped by our own devices. We don't know how to respond. We don't know what to do. So I invite you to pray. At the end of services, when we have our last song, I'm going to be up here. Some of the other leaders are going to be up here. And we invite you to come and pray. Release your burdens, whatever it is that's holding you back. You might not even know what it is sometimes. But when we come together and pray to God and ask God to help us to come clean, that's precisely what he wants from us. And he will help you find a way out and into the light and into peace. Peace for your soul, where you really need it. So we'll, we'll be right up here at the end of services to pray with you. Have a great afternoon and happy Father's Day. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And uh, thank you, Brother Darren, for leading us in that beautiful song, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name, amen? But well, we come to the point in our service where we take some time to remember and reflect on the life, death, burial, and the resurrection of the author and perfecter of our faith. The beloved Son of God, the bread of life, our deliverer, the good shepherd, the great high priest, Emmanuel, the king of kings, the light of the world, the lamb of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah, our Messiah, the only begotten Son. Our Redeemer, our Rock and Savior, the Son of Man, our Teacher and True Vine, the Truth, the Life, the Way, the Truth, and the Life, the Word, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Now, those of us that are parents in this room, we may remember the importance of coming up with a name for our child, or maybe even the children. Maybe you were tasked with uh, naming uh, your, your puppy or your kitten. And I'm pretty sure that when you named it, you didn't just open up a book and randomly, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, choose a name, right? You took some time and effort to go through names and think of who or what that name may be associated with. Uh, maybe some of us got uh, baby naming books and looked up the meanings of the names and tried to uh, add some special significance to what we thought our child might become. Uh, some of us uh, maybe named our children after uh, matriarchs of the family or something like that, or I know many have named uh, their children after a father passing down the name to like Robert Jr., Steve Jr., Daniel Jr., Travis Jr., and so forth. But what about the name of Jesus? Uh, Jesus is the very first name that we see in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And it is the Lord's God-given name. Uh, the angel Gabriel actually said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 31, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Likewise, an angel said to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So here we have the naming of Jesus, but what does his name actually mean? Well, it's translated from the Hebrew name Yeshua. That's a combination of two different words, Yah being an abbreviation for Yahweh, the Hebrew name of God, and Yasha meaning to deliver, rescue, or save. So put together, his name means God saves, right? It's a, it's, his name is beautifully summarizes his identity, being God, the eternal, ever-existing Father in the flesh, and also saves his mission, becoming our salvation through Jesus Christ. Just like God saved the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, he, he saved us from our sin. Often, also when we say the name of Jesus, we will say Jesus Christ, right? And we know that that's not obviously his last name. There really weren't uh, last names at, at that time. But um, 
names were given for either where, where you may have lived, like Jesus of Nazareth, or, or by your parents, like uh, Simon, son of Jonah, or James, son of Zebedee, and so forth. So <clears throat> the word Christ, um, also first mentioned in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, is the Greek word for Messiah, and it means the anointed one. And Jesus was anointed by the Spirit at, at baptism, and he was appointed and, and, and commissioned by God to accomplish his will and carry out his eternal purpose through his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, and his second coming. He was the one whom the prophets prophesied about. In Isaiah 61.1, we see it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. So not only was Jesus the good news, but he is the good news. So whether you were ever in prison or in a jail cell, each and every one of us were sentenced to, uh, were in prison through our sin. We were sentenced to eternity separation from God. But those of us who have closed ourselves with Christ have been released from that prison and saved by God himself who took on earthly flesh and endured it on our behalf. Now, Jesus, of course, had many other names throughout the Bible, each one rich in, in meaning and communicating a different aspect of who and what he is to us. He's called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Jesus reassures us of this in Matthew 28, verse 20, saying, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He's called the Word. We see that in John 1. 1 and in 114, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh, in verse 14, and made his dwelling among us. He is called the Lamb of God, in connection to the Lamb of the Passover feast. We see that in John chapter 1, verse 29. John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Without the shedding of the precious blood of the innocent, spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, there is no forgiveness of sin. There's no get out of jail card. There's no way that we would not pay the full price of our sin, which is eternity in the lake of fire. Like a lamb, Jesus was slain in our place, except unlike a lamb, he was willing. He gave his life to redeem each and every one of us, and when we see all that he went through to fulfill God's righteous requirements, we can only praise his glorious name. So in the entire universe, Jesus is a special name. And I want to take a look at one final verse here. If you can open up to Philippians 2, uh, verse 9 through 11. And it reads, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So family, there is a day coming when everyone will have to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we're grateful that we are able to do that now, and he's not, even as we take this Lord's Supper, we continue to proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. Amen. Let's uh, go to God in prayer for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father God, we just come before you on this Father's Day thanking you for being our Father, thanking you for taking on flesh in Jesus Christ and coming here to this earth to give us an opportunity to be redeemed, Father, to have a relationship with you. We thank you for that desire. We thank you for Jesus Christ who willingly did that it was the only way, Father, who wanted to, wanted to accomplish your will, Father, that loved us deeply, took each and every one of our sins into his body, Father, that was something that we cannot even fathom. But, Father, we, we just want to bless his name and say thank you for Jesus Christ now as we take this bread. It's his name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we come before you now, thanking you for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled. We thank you for the Lamb of God, Father, because we know that the blood of bulls and rams and goats, and Father, we know that they, that was just a temporary fix, Father. We know that the only solution was the, the blood of a willing sacrifice, one that was perfect and pure in every way, Father. And the only one that could possibly do that, Father, was Jesus Christ, was you taking on flesh, Father. We thank you for that blood which covers a multitude of sins, past, present, and future, Father. And we pray that we remember that sacrifice as we take this fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the dark shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Send forth your word. 